everyone. Welcome back to Nurse Tech Podcast. I am Jamie Smith, Chief Education and Compliance Officer with Premier Geriatric Solutions here in Southwestern Virginia. And I am your host. We have Susan Faris, who we are interviewing. Hi there, Susan. Hey, Jamie. How are you? Good um, to see you. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Susan J. Faris, MSNRN. I am the owner of SJF Communications in San Diego, California. And I'm here today and just really happy to be interviewed about uh, what all that we'll be speaking about today. <laughs> so. Glad to have you. So tell us, start now, uh, what got you into nursing? What got me into nursing was a combination of a love for people and science, as well as an early traumatic childhood event, having a, my maternal grandmother who suffered from early Alzheimer's and was ultimately institutionalized. So as a child, I would visit her with my mom and that was kind of devastating to our family because she was institutionalized. Um, but long story short, this was in the 1960s when there were no resources for Alzheimer's caregivers, no daycare centers. And so she was ultimately institutionalized. And it made me grow up a way before my time and mature from this early caregiving experience. And that's how I got into nursing. Also, um, senior year in high school in New Jersey, our guidance counselor and I had a meeting and he was like, well, what, what are you looking to do? And again, I like people in science um, and just I was outgoing and that's why we decided on nursing. And that was 1974, graduating high school. So I became a nurse with my BSN in 78 and then got my master's in 86. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. So ultimately, mm -hmm. your love for people and science, which I can relate to that too, and your traumatic experience like you just shared. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Is what ultimately got you into nursing. Is that right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about your military experience? Sure. Uh, briefly, I spent uh, over 12 years in the military in nursing. So I was an officer in, first in the Navy for three years and then in the Army for the nine and a half years. Uh, all active duty. And I worked in, uh, for clinical nursing, I was in med surge, ICU, orthopedic surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, step down, um, ER, some recovery room, and then uh, nursing education, as well as nursing administration. Th those were my military days. So that was, you know, 12 and a half years changing duty stations every few years, every year to three years, um, and getting my master's through the military as well. Wow, you did a little bit of everything. You said you did ER, you did a little bit of everything. ICU, I heard you say, is that right? ICU, ER, everything was really adult med surge or intensive care or outpatient. Um, so no pediatrics, <laughs> no OB, and no psych. So mostly it. everything else. <laughs> I got it. Um, so we're all different in our own little way, unique. What makes mm -hmm. you different, unique from others? Oh. That's a great question. Several things make me unique. Number one is my name. It rhymes, and I'm a poet. So my name is Susan J. Felice Faris, or Denise Felice Faris, actually, my confirmation name. So uh, I married someone whose name rhymed with my maiden name, Felice <laughs> Faris. Uh, so that makes me unique. I also have had a very non -tra a traditional and yet a non-traditional career in nursing and in my life. Uh, so not too many people are a nurse and they play a nurse on a screen, on a movie screen or, or TV. Um, and I'm a filmmaker, um, I'm a poet and writer. Uh, so not too many nurses do what I do. And now I'm in PR communication. So I kind of transitioned into the communications field about 10, 11 years ago. Does that make me unique enough? <laughs> I oh, think yeah. so. <laughs> oh yeah, you said you're a filmmaker too, is that correct? Yeah, actor and filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Well, that is mm -hmm. pretty cool. Yep. What first drew you to poetry? Poetry. Again, my maternal grandmother. Um, this could be a long story, so I'll try to shorten it. So in 1991, 20 years after she passed away, she passed away in 71, <clears throat> I had gone to see the movie Awakenings with my husband. And that was with Robert De Niro and Robin Williams. It was you know, a fairly popular movie at the time. So I'm sitting in the movie theater and started to cry. And so we got out of the movie theater. My husband's, why were you crying? What's, what's the matter? So there was a character in the movie that reminded me of my grandmother, Anne, that during her late stages just reminded me of her. And it just brought all this emotion back that was bottled up in me. So a few days later, 
my husband and I had, um, you know, been home and, and then he had gone on a business trip. And there was one evening I could not get to sleep. I tried a bath, I tried a glass of wine, I just, you know, was alone, and I just could not sleep. So I grabbed the journal that he had given me for the holiday prior. And it was, was the first time I had written like this, a three page poem poured out of me, which was all about from childhood, up until 20 years later after her death as a nurse reflecting on everything. And it was all about my grandmother. I was laughing, I was crying, I was remembering, it, you know, reminiscing. And that poem allowed me to finally heal from her loss because she was a soulmate. She was really a soulmate. Um, and then ultimately poetry changed my life in that I began to do um, workshops for nurses and the general public. Um, I had a business, a personalized poetry business for a while. And now I've been teaching haiku for the last few years here in San Diego. So poetry, one poem, because um, when I read the poem to my mom the next day, this is in 1991, she was crying and she said, this is the closest thing to what we went through with grandma. I want you to share it with everybody. So at that time in 91, I would get up in groups and, and read this poem. And it ultimately led me to writing more and more. And my book was first published in 93. And then I republished a second edition this year because of the pandemic and how much stress nurses are going under um, with the pandemic, PTSD, et cetera. And I just wanna celebrate nursing and get the word out about what we do and share our caring with the book. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> Oh, you, huh? <laughs> wow, I just don't even know where to start. But um, the three page poem you're saying that started after you went to watch Robert De Niro's movie Awakening. Is that right? Is that it, what really started? The it was a yeah, it was a character named Lucy in this movie. And her faces was just kind of blank. And it reminded me of my grandmother who, by the time she was passed away, she was just very vegetative and mute and confused. And she just reminded me of my grandmother and it just was a floodgate of emotions coming out because we didn't talk about how devastating it was for a really long time. And like I said, the movie was, I saw was 20 years after she passed away. She passed away in 71 and she was only 60 years old when she passed away. Wow. So the early, early onset Alzheimer's back then, nobody knew what it was. And she, you know, so, so the poem illustrates how we went from doctor to doctor and how we would visit her and then up to 20 years later as a nurse reflecting on Alzheimer's and how difficult it is to deal with it um, even despite all the research and we still don't know what really causes it, you know. And so it's kind of a reflection and an examination of going through this as a child and up to 20 years after she passed away as a nurse, as an adult. Wow, and it was a actually, I was gonna say it's 50 years ago that she died. So it's like her 50th anniversary and the book, having the book come out this year, I just realized this a couple of days ago that it's 50 years that that I've been on and off with the poetry. Wow. And you wrote a three page poem and you said your mom read it and said it was spot on. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So and then so I would you know read that poem to different groups that I was in Chamber of Commerce. I was a nurse entrepreneur at the time and I would get up um, even in continuing ed pro programs and read it. And people would come up to me and want to talk about their relative with dementia. So it, it generated discussion and connection with people. So I knew I had something, but I didn't really know what it was. It was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And that caused me to keep writing. And then ultimately the book became a nurse. And the first time it was published was with a nurse owned company, uh, publishing company. And then this time I, I self published. So uh, yeah, it's been a really interesting journey. <laughs> yeah. Well, words can definitely make an impact on people. So yeah, and you also brought up PTSD and how it's real, which brings me to my next question. Today's world needs so much healing. Can you help articulate how poetry can help us heal? Well, poetry is an absolutely wonderful avenue that's therapeutic and cathartic to be able to get our words and our stories out as nurses. Because we have, you know, think about it. Staff nurses, for instance, work with hundreds of patients a year. And all of these stories are inside of us, all this traumatic stuff, and especially with the pandemic and the burnout, the high acuity, the numbers of patients, the PPE, just everything going on. Uh, it's just invaluable to be able to jot your, your thoughts down. And you can do one of three things. You can keep your words to yourself on paper or, or in your laptop or phone. You could throw it away or you could share it with the world. 
And I believe in sharing it because then you connect with other people and they'll be like, oh, I went through that too. Oh, I remember that patient, you know, when we couldn't save them or this code that I was in or, oh my gosh, day shift was so busy today. We can all relate to that. Or night shift is so calm and serene. And, you know, I remember reading the progress notes or whatever. These are all stories that we have uh, and they stick with you um, forever. So why not? release and get the words out and poetry is well, it's actually one form i mean you can write a play you can do a film you can exercise anything that's creative and you're passionate about is very therapeutic and cathartic or can be yeah. i couldn't agree with you more for me exercise and writing helps to relieve mm -hmm. stress and you made the comment you said that all the traumatic things that we deal with as nurses it's in us that code mm -hmm. we ran in, putting on all this ppe taking it off go to the next room put it back on um it jots through our heads and sometimes just writing it down can exactly be something just writing something so small can help release that stress absolutely yeah mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about the book, Poetic Expression in Nursing, Sharing the Caring? Yep, I do have. I don't know if you'll see it with the virtual screen. Let's see. The bar. There we go. There yeah. we go. The hummingbird on there. Yep. And then the back cover has my headshot. Whoa. Nice. <laughs> so um, it, um, it's the same title that I had in 1993, but it's a second edition. And I've added some um nature i do nature photography as well that's another creative outlet that i have awesome. so i have some new yeah. haiku and some of my photos in there um and i released the book both in or actually in paperback ebook as well as audiobook i narrated the audiobook so there's three different ways to get the book um and basically it's over 40 poems of mine plus a couple from other people there's one from a physician at the very end and a few from some friends uh, but mostly they're my poems and they're in different formats. Some rhyme, some, some don't. There are themes in the book, such as family, grief and dying, um, just reflecting on nursing, you know, uh, something on HIV. Because when I first wrote this book in the 90s, HIV AIDS was fairly new. And so it was more of like, gee, what does a person go through that has this? And it's basically similar and relevant to what's going on with COVID today. What is it like? What is that person experiencing with COVID? Um, so there, the book has a variety of poems um, and the reviews have been all spot on. Um, I'm, I'm actually wanting more reviews if, if possible. So if people do get it. And my wish is for nursing groups, the faculty for nursing education programs, like a fundamentals course, this book can be almost a textbook, just in a way to share one person's reflections on many years of nursing, that kind of thing. So it's called Poetic Expression in Nursing. And you said there's three different ways. You can actually, there's an ebook, hard copy, and then another where you... Oh, paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Audiobook. Yeah, Maybe audiobook. There's three different ways. Right. And it has over 40 poems. Is that right? Over 40 poems. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what can this book do for nurses? Is it just a way of like talking about your past and be able to, to relate to absolutely your to, yep, to be able to relate to share it's sharing the caring I mean so it's a way to validate what we do and connect with people and also possibly this is my hope to stimulate others to start writing and I also teach haiku workshops so I invite people that really want to learn about poetry haiku is a succinct very, very short type of poetry that we all might have learned in grammar school or middle school years ago. And um, it's a, also a very interesting way to capture some moments in nursing or in our lives or in nature. Um, it uses our senses and it could use a juxtaposition or an aha moment. So uh, I'm very excited about teaching these workshops. I've been doing it for about two years with the general public and would love to start working with nurse groups as well and, and veterans as well. So, you know, my hope with the book is to just expose if there's about four million nurses maybe even a half of a million <laughs> to find yeah. this book beneficial for them and to maybe say wow i'm proud i'm a nurse or it's for people that love and support nurses or people that are in any caregiving facility you know capacity that that work there uh first responders that kind of thing so that we show the world about what we do because 
it's our responsibility as nurses. And look, you're a nurse communicator right now to help spread the word about what we do because the public, yeah, the public respects us and trusts us. I know that, but do they really know about what our working worlds are? Yeah. Uh, I'm still, still stuck on that first comment you <laughs> made a second ago about how you could see it in nursing course. I couldn't agree more. I mean, just talking about one or two poems could equal an hour or two just talking about yeah. things that happen in real life. I mean, just think about how valuable that would be to a brand new person starting out. Right. And it's also my personal reflections in some of the poems, like when my dad um, in the 1990s had an MI and an angioplasty that failed. And then a double bypass. And I wrote about it, believe it or not. And while we were waiting for him in the OR, because I was writing about telling my mom what he was going to look like, what, what IVs and tubes he would have, and, you know, and that kind of thing. And it just made all the difference for me because it lessened my anxiety. I was there with a journal and I was writing about it as it happened. And, you know, it was like a tribute to him. So all around, it's just so beneficial to get the word out and then maybe help another person. And he was blown away by, wow, you wrote this about me. And it's one of the longest poems in the book because it was wow. so, you know, it was scary because I'm a nurse, but I'm also a human being that has emotions and anxieties and, you know, feelings about things. So it's like a double, you know, advantage to, uh, to get the words out about being a nurse and being a person in general. So tell us, what is your creative passion? <laughs> I think well, it, but... <laughs> I what poetry is, no, but also, sure. <laughs> also, I love nature photography and bird watching. Um, and I love dance and filmmaking and acting. Um, so uh, that's why I love social media, too, to learn about what other people are doing and, and share the, the words um, of what we are up to and that kind of thing. But uh, hummingbirds especially I, I love watching because they they remind me of nurses <laughs> on day shift <laughs> fluttering around you know so fast you know monitoring everybody running around um, and I just love going to lagoons with my good camera or my phone and capturing you know a bird taking off or birds nesting you know that kind of thing I just love that it's very relaxing for me because you need to balance your life with all the type A activity and just chill a little bit too. That's right. Um, with filmmaking and acting, I, I enjoy playing different characters. Um, I've played a nurse on screen in several films, uh, background, but yet on camera. Uh, and just recently played a psychiatrist in a film, mm -hmm. a principal role. So it, it, ha it just makes me happy to be creative. Um, recently, I've been on TikTok and I've put a couple of recipes that I've done and I'm not really a cook, but it's fun to take a video, like I did one yesterday for Thanksgiving, of some apples and yams that I made. <laughs> so, I mean, the sky's the limit. You can be creative with so many things. What what great questions. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm impressed. So you, you did 12 years in the military. You do filmmaking, poetry. You're on your second edition of the Poetic Expression in Nursing. Wow. You're involved with filmmaking. Bird watching, specifically hummingbirds, and you're calling about yeah, you know, because they flap their wings. They say, "What is it, sixty or seventy times in a second?" Very, very quick. Yes, yeah. I don't know the actual, but uh, but very, very quick. A lot. But you know, and then when I got out of the military, it was 1990. I became a nurse entrepreneur because, and I believe that my master's program really helped me with that because it taught us about change, you know, and that. Um, you kind of need to be brave and confident in yourself. But I started doing nursing at continuing education with my company uh, back in 1990, after also doing the Myers-Briggs uh, type indicator and found out that I'm a very creative, although I was in the military, that's a system, you know, bureaucratic system and in nursing, which is a typical, there are some typical types of people that are at, that go to gravitate to nursing, but I was not the typical anything. I was very creative uh, and entrepreneurial. So since 1990, on and off, except for maybe four years, I've been an entrepreneur having my own business. Uh, and then the most recent 10 years, I gravitated to the, uh, public relations. Uh, so I've been a publicist for theaters, filmmakers, musicians, wow. many authors and businesses. And now a couple of artists have reached out to me. 
So it's been a very diverse life in nursing as well as in PR. That is yeah. for mm -hmm. sure. What makes you say that poetry and nursing are natural and an inspiring combination? Ooh. So in poetry and nursing, you know, you're, you're sharing moments that, as we've spoken about a little while ago, that are so important. But also, I, it's just therapeutic. And nurses need therapeutic avenues. So they go, they, they, and it just shows how human we are. Again, poetry shows our humanness and our personal um, vocation of caring for others. A lot of it is caring. You know, in poetry, it's showing the caring. And in nursing, you're showing the caring. You're demonstrating it. So you're just getting the word out about it in the poetry. I like how you connect the two, the sharing, yeah. sharing and just mm -hmm. being therapeutic. Both of them are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned a minute ago, nurse entrepreneur. What is, how would you, def what is it? What is a nurse oh. entrepreneur and how do you become one? Well, uh, when I got out of the military, I talked to my husband and I just needed a break from bureaucracy and uh, belonging to an institution or an organization. And that's what my catalyst was. But a nurse entrepreneur is a nurse that's in business, a nurse that, um, you know, now with me, sometimes it deals with health and wellness, and sometimes it doesn't. It's just that I'm a nurse, that I'm, I'm in business doing PR. Um, so to get started, you need to know who you are. You need to be mature enough to be able to take rejection when you're getting the word out about your business. You need to learn about what you're going to do and feel confident in whatever you undertake as a nurse entrepreneur, um, have fun also and not get too stressed out with it. It's just a different world. It's, it's not a nursing world necessarily, uh, you know, on, on staff or, or whatever, but you're more of a nurse leader. You're a change agent. Um, you, you know your world uh, and you know what your specialty is. And sometimes people branch out in their specialties and have uh, businesses that way. There's a variety of different businesses. And I know there's um, the National Nurses and Business Association. I was a member of that when I first became a nurse entrepreneur. And that way you can connect with other nurses that are in business and learn about them. Um, but you also need to be a good communicator. You need to be able to tell the public what you do and how you do it. Uh, and then get the word out about it, whether it be social media, a website, um, being interviewed like such as this, that kind of thing. So it sounds like when you put how to become a nurse entrepreneur together, I like how you mentioned you got to have fun. You got to be a good communicator. But three, you mentioned rejection because being rejected is part of the journey. You have to learn from those moments. Absolutely. Being an entrepreneur means you're, you know, you're, you're starting something new, you know, and you're in business for yourself. Um, you need to do your paperwork and get your um, business license you know, and find out in your area where you live, what you need for that. Um, if you're, you have to decide if you're a sole proprietor or if you're, you have an LLC, um, that kind of thing, the, the type of business that you have. Um, t you need to invest in telling your community about you so that the people that support you will join you in this journey and get the word out about you um, and, and feel confident in what you do. And learn, be a lifelong learner. Always learn about whatever you're, you know, undertaking as well. I respect but, that. Yeah, because mm -hmm. we learn something every day. <laughs> yeah. So you just answered part of the question, but what are the tips you can share with us on Nurse Deck today for those listening for aspiring nurse entrepreneurs? You mentioned being confident, uh, having business license. What about having a coach? Did you mention that? Sure. There are nurse coaches and, you know, other co other types of coaches, if you think you need one or mentors. I happen to be a mentor at San Diego State University for the last four years, five, almost five years now, where I, I meet with um, the students virtually or in person every couple weeks. And we just kind of gauge where they're at. It's a mutual exchange, helping with career development, um, maybe for graduate school, looking at the schools, that kind of thing. So um, find a mentor. Mentors are very, very important. In fact, there's a poem in the book about mentors <laughs> because mentors have helped me in life. Um, my very, very first job as a nurse in my 20s, I was burnt out and didn't realize it. And a supervisor came up to me and said, by the end of the day, I want you to tell me where you want to work and how much vacation or leave you're taking. 
so like where you want to work when you come back, like to a new place. So I changed from general medicine to cardiothoracic step down unit. And it, it opened up a whole new world for me. So that's another kind of burnout question. Sometimes you might not recognize you're burnt out, but others might. So I must have had a, a, a gaze or facial expression or just something about my personality that changed that was just exhausted or whatever. Uh, and I was young and reflecting back on this, I was probably not mature enough to heal, um, to handle all the death and disease that we were dealing with on a regular basis in general medicine in a very, very busy ward. So it's okay um, if, if things are not going well and you're exhausted and, and you just are depressed about it, and as, especially now with COVID, there may be a mechanism to change jobs, um, take a break from nursing. You may have to. You need to take care of yourself and your constitution uh, emotionally, physically, spiritually, all that. Yeah. You brought up a really good point. You, you, correct me if I'm wrong. You said that your, your manager came up to you. She was able to point out or bring it to light that you were burnt out. Right. She recommended you switch to from med, general med surge over to cardiothoracic. Is that well, correct? She, well, she didn't recommend where I was switching. And she was not my nurse manager. She was my supervisor making rounds. So the supervisor, the evening supervisor was the one. I don't remember her name. It was so long ago. But her impact on me was profound because in that moment, I learned that change was okay. And I had to, you know, and it was thrust on me. I, I didn't say, oh, you're crazy. <laughs> like, what do you mean I have to take vacation? She said, I want you to tell me how long you're going to be gone and where you want to work when you come back. So I figured I always was, you know, fascinated by the heart and cardiology and medicine's not for everybody. It just wasn't for me at that time in my life. So think about that when you're in your specialty, there are so many nursing specialties as well. Um, and that it's okay to change. It's okay to take a break. Vacations are very important, especially now with pandemic. If people are working really long shifts or, you know, for the, extra money or whatever. Um, it's draining and, and you need to recap. You need to, you know, replenish emotionally as well. I'd like to point out some of the things that you highlighted just now. So burnout is real. <laughs> she helped point that out. And you mentioned to take a break. You got to take care of yourself. And then the next thing you said that is very important is that change is okay. Sometimes yeah. change is necessary. Absolutely. Change is my, one of my best friends, <laughs> as you can see from my career, <laughs> you know, uh, from getting out in the military, it was very diverse. And since the military, I've done so many different things. I've done legal nurse consulting, the acting, and a lot of the change was presented due to geographic changes with my husband's corporate um, lifestyle. When he was changing jobs, east to west coast, I would have to pick up and say, okay, do I need to get my license first? And, you know, the nursing license again in a different state. And what do I want to do here? And just things presented itself and I've reinvented. That's another good word for me to stress is reinvention is okay as, as well. You don't have to stay in the same position all your life or the same unit, but many people choose to, and I value them as well. But I know that for me, change was almost vital, if not, necessary at certain times and circumstances. Susan, can you tell us about the SJF communications and the service it offers? Sure. SJF communications, after my initials, Susan J. Faris, is a PR company. So public relations, marketing, social media, we do websites. Um, I'm a writer and, and poet, as you know now, and I'm a mentor, um, filmmaker and actor. And uh, so I have a very diverse career. And so my business works with so many different types of clients um, over the years since 2011 or so, yeah, about 10 years. Um, and since 2016, I went freelance after working with one theater for five years. Since 2016, I've been diversifying the types of clients that I have. Um, each client is different. Um, <laughs> and, and what I do in PR is kind of like nursing. I still use my nursing process in a way, assessing, planning, you know, interventions yeah. and evaluation. I feel like I'm on call a lot because working from home 
and having a flexible schedule with clients. Uh, if there's an emergency or you know a, a crisis or just a question that comes up, they know that they can reach me at certain times. You know, you need to be available for for people in PR. Um, it's just been a real pleasure, uh, and I've been very supportive by my family, my husband, my daughter. Um, it's been very interesting. It's fun. I've traveled with this, uh, and I've learned a lot because each client teaches me what they do in their world. So I've learned more about each world, the theater world, the filmmaking, authors, actors, uh, filmmakers, I said, uh, and now a couple of artists who, you know, I, I'm learning about the art world. So cool. <laughs> and then the mentoring, you know, is uh, something that I do for my volunteering giving back. So um, it's just been a really wonderful life. And my uh, tagline is creative ideas, re dynamic results. So we try to be creative with every client and then boom, we get either interviews or written up in the press or TV, you know, um, highlights or features and that kind of thing. Um, well, that quote, creative ideas. Dynamic results. I like it. <laughs> uh, can you tell us more? You said you're in public relation now. What's the amazing connection between public relation and nursing? Um, gee, I think it's what I bring it. <laughs> because, like I said, you need to be a good communicator. So you must be a good communicator with PR. You must be able to listen as well as communicate and get the word out. Uh, as far as nursing, I mean, my PR background is diverse, just like my nursing career has been. Um, there are just, as in nursing, we work with many different people, different cultures. And in my entrepreneurship, I do that with the SJF Communications as well. So there's many parallels. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. What do you consider the most meaningful work you've done create, creatively so far? Creatively? so many things it's hard um one thing that we did last two years ago right before the pandemic is we made a film called life after oblivion and it was about a um, military member with ptsd and i played the psychiatrist in that film um three of us veterans and then a few other civilian uh females but three ma two males and myself that were veterans and two other females were all producers of this film and it, it ended up being in the GI Film Festival. So, um, and it, it, it was a short film. We had at least 15 veterans involved with it. Um, so we've kind of given back by doing this film and shining a spotlight on PTSD and, um, and how people need to reach out when they're you know, depressed and, and such. Um, so that's very meaningful. I've worked with so many great clients um, my website has a list of the clients that I've worked with and just getting, getting press coverage or um, a television feature always makes me happy for my clients. Um, so I can't, I've had so many great, wonderful, creative, meaningful uh, things that have happened in PR and the sky's the limit, you know? I, I can't get over you, how much you do, you do so much. So this movie you said is called life after oblivion is that life correct? after oblivion right one of the veterans wrote the screenplay and it was based on a short story in a group here in san diego by a, a veteran and then our my um friend wrote the screenplay for our film and then we shot the film uh, over a weekend back in february 2019 and uh it was a competition that we were in um we finished right before the pandemic and then we went on to the GI Film Festival of four groups. We were the only group that went on to the festival. So it was just a really, it was a team building effort. Um, we learned all about producing a film and, um, you know, getting our word out. And hopefully someday we'll see it more shown. Yeah. yeah. It included 15 veterans. In at least 15. Yeah. At least 15 veterans were part of it. And then other civilians were. Um, and we shot it at a beautiful preserve and at an airport in the Bakersfield area of California. Yeah, so um, I might be able to put some information like a website if, if you want me to do that and then about my business and the book and things like that, um, just to share the value of that. But 
I'd, I'd need about 15 minutes to think about all the meaningful things that I've done with PR because it's just an exciting, it's an exciting world. And the fact that I don't have my degree in PR or communications shows how resourceful I was. And that's another point for nurses. If you want to be a nurse entrepreneur or you want to, you know, go to a different area, learn about it, be resourceful, ask questions, um, maybe take somebody for coffee, find a mentor. Uh, use your LinkedIn and your social media in good ways and that kind of thing. So find a mentor, educate yourself, always mm -hmm. learn, never stop asking questions. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So do you have any recent or, or forthcoming projects that you'd like to promote? <laughs> well, the book for sure. Yeah. Um, I've been doing a lot of interviews about the book and um, book signings. Now that COVID has been a little bit better we'll see how the fall is and the winter. Um, but just getting the word out and reaching different groups and faculty members, uh, schools of nursing, that kind of thing about the book, um, doing as many interviews like this and podcasts, um, blogs, that kind of thing, connecting with buy? others. What's that? Where do you buy it on Amazon? Oh, it's all over. Yes. It's on Amazon in paper book, ebook, and, um, audio book, but it's also, you can go to an independent bookstore and just ask for it and they can order it for you. Yeah, wow. I, it's at the San Diego airport. So if anybody's traveling, it's at JFK airport and Newark airport in one of the stores. So we're gradually getting it into the airport stores, um, independent bookstores. Uh, and because of COVID, I've had to do many um, interviews like virtually, but now I'm starting to do some in-person events as well. So I did, I did so one cool. in Coronado last week and um, Temecula, California. So now uh, during the holiday season, I'm planning for next year's events. And some of the, the ones I'd love to do are some nurse week events. So if you guys know any of your facilities that want to have me travel there or do a virtual event, um, online haiku, talk about the book, teach some poetry, that kind of thing, I would love to be included in that for nurses week because we've got till May. All right, Susan. So what do you want to tell our nurses of today and to our nurses of tomorrow? The nurses of today, first of all, is to hang in there. If you feel burnt out, speak to your supervisor. Just let people know that you're struggling. Don't keep it inside and seek help if you need to. Um, write about it. Do something creative. Try to Try to get your release. Uh, and if need be, make a change if you need to in your work. Take a break. The nurses of tomorrow, I really think you need to be a nurse in your heart. I think not to be motivated by the money, but to be old fashioned way is, of a nurse never leaves me. Having a good heart, caring about people, um, just being mesmerized by people and connecting with people. When you're a new nurse, I know you're going to be busy because you're putting your skills together for the first time. But remember that that patient in the bed, you know, just for you to help comb their hair or have them put some lipstick on or, uh, you know, just walk them one extra time or just sit there and ask them to talk about their lives will make all the difference in their life. And, you know, there's nothing like, uh, like for me, when I was in the Navy, this is back in the late 70s, on night shift, there would be guys that were smoking in the solarium, the day room, the, the lounge. And I'd go up to them and say, let's put that cigarette out and let's just chat. And they were Vietnam vets. This was in the Navy. And it was so therapeutic for them to get their stories out and me listening. So be a good listener. You never know who you will connect with that will remember you forever. Oh, that, that, that's, that's the truth. A lot. It's the truth. And yeah. I love how you mentioned the small things. It may seem small, but really you can mean someone's day, just talking to them, seeing how they're doing, combing their hair, like you said, asking them what, what's their favorite beverage and go get it for them or something. Exactly. Small. exactly. Yes. Connect. So, so amidst COVID-19 pandemic, nurse burnout has been widespread phenomenon. What prevents burnout and what should people do if they begin to notice symptoms of burnout? Oh, okay. I'm going to read something here. Well, first of all, things in nursing that can cause burnout, long hours, high numbers of patients, stressful specialties, 
shift stress, like rotating, um, physical exhaustion just as a result of work stress, um, battle fatigue, just, you know, one patient after another, all the death that they had to deal with this past couple of years, high patient acuity, poor patient outcomes or errors, um, and unrealistic expectations. Um, so many ventilated patients, a lack of PPE, a lack of emotional support, a lack of critical incident stress debriefing. So like if somebody codes to talk about it as a group with your, with your managers, um, so people can seek counseling, you can develop a little bit of resili resilience by releasing your stress. And I believe through the creative arts or through a passion that you might have to be able to protect your being and your emotional exhaustion um, that way. Um, and this also affects caregivers, like not even nurses, but caregivers of people like my when my grandmother had Alzheimer's, people that are family members that are caregivers, they get burnt out too. So it's not just exclusive to nursing, it's exclusive to the caring professions. Um, I mean, think about housekeeping in a hospital with COVID. Think about all the different demographics and, and the work situations um, and work capacities that have been affected by this. So things that you can do in the future too, like, like I said, be, be creative, find someone that you trust, set realistic goals, um, be realistic about people's, you know, diseases and stuff. Um, I, I don't know. Talk to a professional if you need to be honest and know your limits, educate yourself as much as possible and develop new tools for, for coping and stay healthy. It's, you know, it's easy to st not eat well or eat wrong, or, you know, um, take care of yourself as much as you can, because you are so important, <laughs> you know, we, won't, yeah. we, we don't want to lose you. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, no, I think, I think that kind of covers you know, I bet some people are going to be wa watching this and saying, yep, check, check, check. Because <laughs> you mentioned long hours, physical fatigue, because you're working so many hours, and the high acuity patients, and then ventilated patients require, you know, a lot of attention. And, and yeah. all the deaths that people have had to deal with more this past two years than in their entire career. There, there are seasoned nurses out there that hadn't had to deal with as many deaths and codes and, and, and just the high acuity patients. Yeah, I think realizing yeah. that a person is burnout is a big step because sometimes nurses don't want to ignore, like they know something's not right, but they don't realize that burnout, right. they are burnt out and they just don't know how to convince exactly. them that, like that's what's going on. And so I like your feedback with setting realistic goals, talking to a professional um, and staying healthy. You have to take care of yourself. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So. Yeah. What can community or organizations do to, to prevent burnout in systems like work, school, and healthcare? Well, let's just talk about work for now. I mean, not as much school. The nurse leaders need to be good communicators and have really good, I guess, intuition so that they know if people on their staff are stressed out. And they need to be able to be trusted and loyal to their team, that these managers, um, so that you can go to them. You need to be able to trust and feel comfortable approaching them. Uh, and if they have constraints, then go. You may have to go higher than your nurse manager. You may, you know, be bold. Have do your homework. Um, if you have to show numbers of acuity or or whatever, follow your convictions. And because you, you've got to preserve yourself and take care of yourself. That's right. Because without us nurses, there's no health care system and we are needed. That's exactly right. You know? In which areas can nurse tech advocate more to help the co nursing community and make it easier for nurses to connect? Uh, yeah, just add resources on nurse tech um, and cultivate different, maybe different groups of nurses. Uh, just make it accessible on all the platforms. Um, I've, I've actually added a uh, nurse deck on my social media today. So I'm learning more about nurse deck as well. I think it's fascinating that it's a nice new community um, that cares about nurses and nursing. 
Yes, for sure. Is there a topic, Susan, that you would like to discuss or address that we haven't already? No, I think we've covered a lot. I really do. I'm, I'm so satisfied with the questions that you asked. And I hope that, I hope that with my world, as, as far as not being clinical, I'm keeping my license always, but I'm not in clinical nursing at this point. So I value what the clinical nurses are doing at this time and we need you. And, um, and yet I can bring insight into another world of nursing as well. Thank you, but we also need you as well. Your poems make a difference. People, sometimes words, and just one poem for me, because I love to read, can just make my entire day. I love quotes, and it, it can just set my, my whole day. So I can't do wait. You, do you, well, do you have time for one or two poems from the book? Yes, come we on. Do? Okay. Yes. Okay, so this is called Giving Thanks. Nurses know the paleness and coolness of shock, the dusky blue hues of cyanosis, the significance of impending doom, the fear in their eyes when fate is unknown, the wails of terminal pain, the scent of pseudomonas, the tenacity of suction secretions, the fruity breath of ketoacidosis, the predictable patterns of Cushmol breathing, the jello-like non-rhythmic quality of ventricular fibrillation, the bedlam in a code, the frustration when a patient is non-compliant, the intensity of patient care, the thank yous mean so much. Be thankful, nurses know. So that's nurses giving thanks. Um, and this is called the nurse. The nurse. If and when you thirst for comfort, when your pain just won't subside, or your tears reveal the grief that you've been carrying inside, who's the person calming all, answering bells that beckon call? It's the nurse. There's no doubt. It's the nurse. If and when you're one day post-op and it's time to take a glance at your fresh brand new incision, body image unenhanced, who's the person near your side with compassion one can't hide? It's the nurse, there's no doubt, it's the nurse. No matter when you have the need through illness, wellness, birth or life's end, the nurse is so supportive, simply one of a kind whose comfort and knowing can mend. If and, if and when you're in need for the quality of life, while all others may seem out of place, call the nurse, heed the nurturing, caring, support, blessed with wisdom, connection, and grace. That's beautiful. Uh, you are so talented. <laughs> well, it just pours out of me. I can't help it's it. It's happening <laughs> too. Like I, I hear it and I can relate and I can see it. So nice to meet you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Right, bye. bye.